two, one. This podcast is brought to you by Irish supplement company Revive Active. As GA training has returned for all adults, Revive Active's Zest Active aims to support your energy, immune system, and muscle function, while their joint complex aims to support your cartilage, connective tissue, and bones. This makes them the ideal supplements for the GA season ahead. As always, you can get 10% off all products on reviveactive.com using the code BACKDOORGA10. Delighted to be joined by Joe Sheridan, Paddy Kassan and Danny Hughes um, to look back on round one of the Allianz Football League. But um, Paddy, for you, I suppose it's extra special now being top of the fantasy uh, football league. Yeah, I'm delighted, yeah. Delighted. Um, Makes up for uh, Cork's disappointing start yesterday. Um, yeah, sure. Look, it adds a bit of adds, add a bit of a a bit of crack or an extra bit of interest. Yeah, so may it continue for the next few weeks and may they increase the prize money or something or whatever. You know, <laughs> but uh, no, all good, John. A bit of fun. It's good. And where did it all go wrong for your team this weekend, Joe? For oh, me, is it? Yeah. Oh, yeah sorry for Joe. Sorry, sorry. Excuse me, go on, Joe. Well, I was just saying earlier, we were giving Paulie a bit of a, a bit of a boost after the, the beat for Paul Kessie, so we didn't want to just rain on the prey too much, and we'll give him a, the first week ahead, and we'll, we'll go from Adam next week then. <laughs> Fitness will be a problem. <laughs> <laughs> and what happened to your team, Danny? Um, uh, somebody could maybe tell me, because I didn't have a chance to look at it yet. <laughs> Why, was it not good? Uh, I think you're just sitting above the relegation zone. Ah, well, that's typical sort of my career, actually. <laughs> Sitting just about above the relegation zone, probably. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I, I, I Clifford, I think I have Clifford in, anyway. Yeah. I think so if he, keeps, if he keeps doing the business there that he's doing, I should uh, start to claim the table, you know. As uh, Potty used to say to me, Hughes, he says, it's, uh, it's a marathon, not a sprint, you know. <laughs> It's a marathon, not a sprint. That's right, that's right, yeah. You used to say that to me when you picked pick me up, for uh, <laughs> Did I say that, should I? Oh, yeah, well, yeah. I, said, I said many things. <laughs> <laughs> I'm more of a sprint man than a marathon man now, so. <laughs> but um, getting into it anyways, lads, uh, I suppose we'll have to start... Pains me to say it, but Kerry's result against Galway, uh, four twenty-one to eleven points. Um, probably like an exceptional performance by David Clifford alone yesterday. I think if you weren't from Galway, everyone was just interested in watching him against Galway yesterday. Yeah, look, look, exceptional performance. Look, we all know what a great talent he is. Like, but I just think is the performance overall by Kerry. Obviously, were. You know, going to put a marker down is something we discussed a few weeks ago with the top teams. But I think if you still compare Galway, like Galway, it's far and away, like their first game back after COVID last year when the league started, they, they got a big enough hammering from Mayo, if I'm right. Like, so that's kind of, you know, the way, like, with all, with all even greens, the ins and outs of it, you know, and we all know Galway have good footballers. But like, what I'm trying to say is, like, based on that last year, like, I don't think it's a case of, like, Kerry have put a sign out, but not a case of everyone getting carried away. Like, do you know what I mean? Like, because you know, they got the early goals and then as a contest, then it was kind of over. Like, so like, it's, it's, do you know what I mean? Like, so yes, exceptional scoring from, from David Clifford and obviously Kerry would be very hard to beat this year, but at the same time, keeping it a small bit in context or maybe over the next few weeks, we'll see their performances against um, Dublin Ross Common in a compare further, you know? Yeah, as well, one noticeable thing yesterday, um, Joe, you could see the difference between the sides going, Nearly took a hop, a solo, or a hand pass, but Kerry every time we're just trying to play it through the foot. Yeah, and and, and the thing about Kerry, they had the players to do that across the pitch. Um, you know, it, it was sort of they were laying out the marker from obviously last year's disappointment, and they probably had to do that. I'd say a lot of pressure was coming from inside of Kerry themselves, and it was um, look, I, I I love seeing Kerry play football because they play it so pure, and they have the players to be able to do that. Um, obviously with Cliff have been look at the minute. Naturally, and 
sort of as an all around footballer, he's probably the best in the country at the minute. Um, you know, someone was getting a bit excited and comparing him to the expectation of him and LeBron James coming on the scene. I only read today, and it, people do get quite ex- excited about these things, and certain players come onto the scene. and He's, he's phenomenal talent, and even the goal he got from the, the soccer style on the ground. Like, uh, I was only chatting with Farrell today, and he was saying, like, most good inside forwards could do that, but they just don't dare to do it, you know. And for him to have the confidence to do it and sticking in the back of the net, it, it was incredible. And it was, um, yeah, it was a great performance by Kerry, defensively structured very well, um, sat back a lot of players, but attacked very quickly on, on the turnaround. And as you were saying, like the kick pass in it is very accurate and moves the ball extremely quick. And, um, you know, it was it was a widespread of scoring across the board as well. Was, I don't know Clifford got three six, but you know there was there was a lot of scoring. Like Killian Flan had four points before half time. You know, so it set them up. The, they were they were moving well at half time. Galway were just very disappointing, to be honest. Uh, they got very flat, out of ideas, um, and they they didn't sort of they didn't look to have a plan at all. You know, they knew they were going out to carry. They had to sort of come at them, and they just sat back as if they were just expecting things to happen. And it was um, I'm sure. And Paul Joyce will be scratching his head how, how, how it was such a poor performance. But look, it's the first round. Kerry had a point to prove. Goal, we might be working on things and bringing new younger lads into the team. And that doesn't really help come down to Kerry, to be honest, for the first round. So it was a, it was a great performance and it'll be interesting now next week with Dublin. So, um, yeah, it was, um, it was great to see it. Uh, and look, they probably need it after last year. So. And, Danny, like, Galway were very naive, I suppose, going man-on-man early on. But even going man-on-man, they were nearly socially distanced and marking the carry forwards. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, I think they've maybe taken the, the, uh, the advice from the government too literally because, listen, I, I've been saying it even last year, people, I suppose Galway, Galway supporters have been used to this purest type of game it's you know it's nearly ingrained in their DNA from a hurling and a football perspective, and they got their wish when uh, Porg Joyce was appointed. To, you know, and I think even Porg himself would have set out to be much more uh, attack minded, much more offensive, and um, to be less structured in how they defend and how they um, how they play the game. And you know, despite the bit of a bounce that every team gets from a new management. After the after the uh, the first lockdown last year, Galway Galway were extremely poor, and uh, and this, you know, my concerns from, from uh, if I was a Galway supporter or even one of the panel members was that this is a common theme now. Galway's got hammered against good teams um, a few times now, um, so I would be concerned about that lack of a structure, that lack of uh, of organisation that Kevin Walsh had, uh, to be fair. Um, and when you see that he had Galway going really, really well at one time, like Galway were, I suppose, they were coming into a semi-final of All-Ireland and they were playing Dublin and they were in a league final as well. And I suppose Paddy Talley, our own manager, had had them really well set up. And with players like Shane Walsh and uh, Damien Comer, although Damien Comer's coming back from a, a long injury. So I'd be really concerned for Galway. Um, I'm really concerned... Um, about poor Joyce in that there's no doubt in that he was he was a purist as a footballer himself. He was absolutely magnificent, one of the best ever. But he needs uh, poor Joyce needs to I suppose wake up to the fact that the modern game now, um, he's he's going to be judged on the results that he gets, and especially against them big teams. And they can't take keep taking drubbings like that, or or poor Joyce is going uh, poor Joyce is going to be deemed very very naive. And I suppose from a carry perspective, yes, there could be there could be an element where there is a bit of a backlash from Kerry, but what makes last year even more astounding was that why why couldn't Kerry go out and do that against Cork? Why couldn't Kerry do that week on week? You know, it's the first round of a of a of a, of a national league. Yes, fair enough, but you know, if anything, when you, when you seen how they performed yesterday, you begin to ask questions like why why was that? Why has it taken three years now for for Kerry to be playing this way? Um, not to say that it has taken three years, I'd be wrong, but why revert back to last year? And I, and I think management probably should learn a lot from this is how Kerry play. And as Joe said, 
as a neutral, we all want to see Kerry play that way. We don't, we don't, we don't want to see Dublin dominate the championship and the contenders being Tyrone, being Kerry, being Mayo. We, we want to see them express themselves. And, and, and yesterday, Kerry went and done that. And, and, and in Clifford and boys like that, they, they have all the firepower there to, to rival Dublin. So I, I hope I hope Kerry, that's a, last year was a bit of a wake-up call and, and that they'll go forward and, and try and do what Kerry do. And Paddy, do you think when you look at it, this goal team, as Danny mentioned, two severe hammerings um, in the last two years, do you think when you do look at it overall that maybe you have to think that Kevin Walsh overachieved with Goa? No, I don't think it's a case of overachieving. I just think it's a case of maybe by the time Kevin Walsh finished up with Galway or even to, since then, he maybe is due a bit more credit in a sense of the work that he did do. Because again, right, yes, they were defensively solid, but they still, right, it wasn't a attacking, um, they, didn't, they weren't similar to Kerry, but at the same time, they were they were offensively threatening as well. Like, and, and, and um, so, you know what I mean? Like, so getting to, they won a lot of games, competing in the international leagues, getting to Ireland in the semifinals. So I don't, no, I, I don't think they overachieved, but I just think it's a, I suppose the, the way they look at it now, like, it's just, they just think that they'll reflect on people look back now on Kevin Walsh's period and kind of give him a bit more um, credit maybe for the work that was done rather than saying, like, I don't think it was down to players, everything under overachieving. I think what we're all agreeing, we'd agree now on is that it, Galway's performance yesterday, you'd look at it, that's them underachieving rather than being a re- reality of where they are. Like, do you know what I mean? So I just, I just think there's an issue for Potter Joyce to deal with, like, is it like, right, did a very bad start, really bad start yesterday, and then did a really bad start in the May, against May on the National League last year, and, and they resulted in, we call it, say, hammerings. Like. So then I think that's just something they have to deal with internally, and I don't have the answers necessarily for them right now, like, but like, that's just something that, like, what's, the, what's going to happen in, say, a couple of months' time when they're playing a Connex semi-final, and maybe they could go down six points. You know, it could happen. You know, teams can get, even just due to misfortune, What's going to happen then, like, you know? So, um, yeah. So I suppose that's that's my eyes, and I, def- I don't see it as I don't think Kevin Walsh overachieved. I just think he did overall the team management they did well during that period, like. Yeah, no, it's definitely a good point to raise. If go, I do go behind again, but even for Kerry Joe yesterday, like when you consider racking up four twenty one and without James O'Donoghue, Tony Brosnan, Stephen O'Brien. And all these players to come back into the Kerry team as well. Yeah, look, and, and you know, realistically, Kerry have the players. You know, they, they've never had an issue with having not having enough good good enough footballers. It's about getting the right mix. And uh, to be honest, with the likes of James, I don't, know, I don't think he will even come back into the mix. It might be in like Kerry brought on seven subs yesterday, and he wasn't one of them. So unless he's injured, I just don't see him involved. And um, he's just been out with injuries the last couple of years, and it's a He's a massive loss, but I think they'll have to move on and um, with the players that they have and they have enough good players to be able to bring on. And um, they brought on a, another young fella, what was Apollo Shea from yeah. like Clifford Jesse. Um, you know, so if, he, if he's anything like as good as Clifford or the body Clifford themselves, you know, he, he's gonna be another boost. And he, he came on for Gainey. Gainey went off, wasn't as an effect, as effective. Um, but a lot of the younger carry players, they don't seem to have any fear. And the good thing <laughs> Massive plus for Kerry is that the free taker Sean O'Shea, like so consistent, he's incredible from 55, 60 yards. And he, you know, for the top teams, you have to have that. And when you even look at Dublin, like Costello scored 113 today, and I think 118 from base balls or 19 from base balls. And you, you need that. Um, and he's not even their main free taker. So, you know, for, for Kerry, that's, you know, they have the, the base of a very good squad. And as Paulie was saying last year, what they were doing, you know, it, it was probably, I'm well, sorry, Danny was saying that it was, why didn't they play like this? You know, why did they revert back to the defensive structure? Was it because they were overlooking Cork and they were looking towards Dublin? How would they beat Dublin? You know, and I don't think that's what Kerry should be doing. They should play to their strengths, obviously a defensive structure because they were quite open last year and the year before that. Um, and that's what Peter Keane is trying to work into it. But, you know, Trust your players to be able to make these decisions. They're, they're very clever footballers, most carry footballers, and you know they, they can read the game quite well. And I'm, I'm sure they don't need a massive amount. Of thinking, but it's um, I think putting the trust in them, and especially last year, it just 
looked like Peter Keane took all the trust away from the players and it, it just wasn't it wasn't a Kerry team that most people would be used to watching. And look, ho- hopefully this year we'll see the best best of them and, and the, the way they play their football is fantastic. But it's um look as as the boys are saying, it's the first round. Let's not get overexcited. Fantastic score. Galway aren't at the level that Kerry are at the minute. And um, you know, it's it's an upper curve for Kerry after last year and we'll see how it goes next weekend. If we uh, move on to the other game that was on yesterday um, between Donegal and Tyrone, uh, Donegal 18, Tyrone 16. Um, obviously, Danny, first about Tyrone, obviously a lot of hype about them this year. So many talented footballers in this squad this year. For you, did this style for Tyrone change much to the Mickey Hart era yesterday? What, uh, listen, I think that the journey that the two guys are going to have to embark on isn't uh isn't isn't the goal with isn't uh, uh everything's get swept out um and you just totally forget about the hard work that's that's been put in you know you have to give credit to mickey hart on on his team that they had put a structure in that had i think uh got Tyrone to a stage where they were winning all the titles they were in all Ireland super uh or obviously the super eights they were in semi-finals and obviously a final a couple of years ago. So the structure was there. Um, the expectation in Throne is almost, it's, uh, it became, uh, how would you say it? It, be, it? it became so great that only in all Ireland now for Throne is seen as equivalent to what, what they had in the last decade. And, you know, it's, what, 13 years since Trump won in All-Ireland, but they've been so used to success now and building that reputation as as the Kingpins and Ulster and Donegal have obviously come in and challenged that narrative. But um, I, I, the, Logan and Doher will be quite smart in how they transition Trump into being uh, probably trying to retain that structure, but mm-hmm. trying to be a wee bit more offensive, you know, and... Uh, you know, there wasn't a huge difference in how they played. But you could see players like Paul Donnelly who came in yesterday, you know, and it probably doesn't reflect well on the previous management that this guy has been knocking about the club level and performing really, really well. His his club, uh, Dungan and Clarks, won the, won the club throne championship. And without Donnelly, they wouldn't have won it. And the reality is that he never got a sniff at county level. And you really, you would question that when you seen yesterday's performance from him, um, and you when you question if if that was the case, uh, so you have Donnelly that came in, and you've McKenna, you've all the other guys that that have still to come in the panel, and it was interesting to see that guys like Tiernan and McKellen, boys like that, weren't in any even in the panel yesterday. So I I would see Thrones as a bit of a journey. I don't think they'll be too disappointed with the with the defeat. Yes, they were beat by two points by Donegal, the rivals, and all the rest of it. But I don't think they'll be too disappointed because Donegal is, you know, Declan Bonner's in his fourth year there. So they're on a bit of a project. They're, they're a wee bit more down the road. And and you can't tell me that Donegal, or Tyrone, sorry, won't make those two points up um, in the next four to six weeks. So, uh, you know, I think Tyrone's going to be very, very hard to stop. Um, but I, I think the two guys will, will get it right. Like, I, I do believe that you know, they're two very intelligent guys, uh, good football men. And I think with that bounce, they'll they'll use the structure and the foundations that have been built previously and probably tweak it to go forward a wee bit more with an added couple of players that they found, you know. And the one thing about this game, Paddy, um, compared to the rest of the games, it was probably the game across all the leagues that had the intensity, I suppose, that had a battle and that was a real competitive encounter. I suppose there was, but I still felt it was competitive. But then whether it's from familiarity, I thought at times like both teams were still able to create a lot of opportunities, like in a sense in the score, you know, like the score line 18, 18 points, 16. Do you know what I mean? Like I just sensed that like it was, do you know what I mean? Like say, like you might say, I know, say Cork at times found it hard to break down Kildare would say, right. But then even though both teams, Tyrone and Donegal were getting in behind the ball, both teams they were tra- like they were transitioning the ball really quickly. They were getting the ball into space, you know that kind of way. So like while there was while there was intensity to it, while there was certainly a few, you know you could see like there was a bit of verbals, a couple of off the ball 
instance, and etc. You know, you knew there was an edge to it, like, but still, while there was that edge, I still thought it was, I thought it was quite open still at times, like, do you know what I like, and whether that comes down, as I said, is that just down to familiarity of, you know, of right, both teams expecting, um, knowing or expecting how the other team has set up it would actually remember but then we're kind of just from just from practice we're able to deal with it like do you know that's right off in the game and as well for Donegal um, Joe they have proven over the last few years now that they have the upper hand on Tyrone and it, it is really becoming a dominance now when Donegal and Tyrone do meet yeah they're very obviously um, winning creates that confidence every time you're coming up against them and you know the intensity that the two teams bring against each other it's like northern football is that case that you know even in the national league in a normal case and he'll obviously have more experience but you know the northern teams will have intensity across the board in every game that they play against each other and it's just over the years that's been the case but Donegal seem to be very confident every time they go out against any Ulster team now you know they feel they're the best team in Ulster um they're playing like they are the best team and they probably are at the minute. It's, it is quite close with Tyrone. Um, and I, I think, you know, we, we, we questioned Michael Murphy's hunger and, you know, he was he was phenomenal. You know, he, he drove things on, he kicked six points. Um, Adam McBrady, I think, kicked four points as well. Um, you know, so you, that, that's 10 points out of your 18 points that these two boys are after kicking in. And if them lads are still doing that, the lads, the support team that they have around them, you know, it's it's only going to look good for Donegal over the next couple of weeks and going into the championship. And it's um, as as the boys are saying, like they're at a def- different level, especially for this game. And, and Danny made a good point. Like Tyrone, I don't think it will be too worried about this loss. You know, they'd be great that it was more about the performance and how the new structure would set up. You know, they did move the ball a lot quicker, and they probably would have with Mickey Hart. You know, would have been a bit slower through the hands, a bit more precision to the attack, whereas it was a bit more, you know long ball kick and pass kick passing it into full forward line and and they try to create opportunities off of that but you know Donegal have, have, a, have a the speed that they play at you know that the counter attack that they when they turn the ball over you know and they seem to get their scores quite easily um and in the right positions and that's what they they've done over the last couple of years they're looping around that's coming off left and right and working into that D area and, and they've done it again yesterday and, and it, it was it was just shows that that sort of level of maybe three or four years on as a team structure um, probably just got them over the line yesterday and it's um, it would be interesting how things go in the Ulster Championship then. And a big thing for Tyrone as well, um, Danny, the positioning of Conor McKenna, I suppose, we've seen him under Mickey Hart at 11 and yesterday he was at 14 and he went well at stages, but I suppose it would be perfect for that inside line to have someone like McKenna who can supply the ball in. Oh, oh, listen, Conor McKenna is exceptional. I have him in my fantasy team as well, so that's uh, as always handy. So, um, I'm hoping that uh, that he's gonna he's gonna um, since I'm above the relegation zone, I I'll need to start. He would need to start kicking a few more goals. But, um, no, see, Conor McKenna. I think the type of player that Conor McKenna is, and this is, you know, we've seen it last year that you could do with him out the field, and you could do with him inside. Um, so. You know, Mickey Murphy, when you look at Donegal, when you you see how influential, Mickey Murphy has been the, been the most influential footballer uh, in Ireland, um, I would say, for the good part of the decade. Um, when you look at what he's done, he's single-handedly driven Donegal to the top table. And when you take Mickey Murphy out of Donegal, for example, and as a consequence, you'll take McBurdy out because he does supply McBurdy with a lot of stuff there as well. You're, you're, you're going to have problems. And Dara said, like, uh, Tyrone would have probably the potential to be a much more rounded team. Like Kerry, uh, in a fact, where if you take Clifford out, if you take that 3-6 out, um, it becomes a closer game. And teams without uh, Clifford in it, they probably are by. So you have problems if you're reliant on, on, on the Aggies and Lewis as well. If you're reliant on one player or two players, the problem is when they get shut down in a game. Now, it'd be different if Michael Murphy was 21, but Michael Murphy's probably coming in nearly 30 now, or maybe just over. But, you know, when you look at Tyrone, when you look at McKenna, he's come back from Australian rules. He's got all that um, training and structure behind him. And when you see how well he performed last year, I think Conor McKenna should be given a free role 
uh, from corner forward and just told, just go out and play it where you want. The way the modern game has went anyway, it would probably suit him. Um, and Dara said, you have your two inside as well as your, your half forward line, which are very industrious, and Donnelly yesterday, who was getting the score. So you would have to say that Conor McKenna could be given that license to go where he wants if he's in the game. Uh, go to keep delivering on where he is on that particular uh, end of the field. But, you know, if he's out of it for, as you say, for five or 10 minutes or in patches, he's not in it, then he has that license to go, go to the middle of the field, start maybe mm. dominating ball, etc. there. So, you know, you would have, you would have to say that the type of Conor McKenna, a guaranteed starter, the quality that that's there, you would have to give him a bit of a free role there. But I think that that will probably be developed by the, by the management and you know a uh, Connor Neely himself will know when to go and when when to stay and when to go himself. So I think it's about empowering players. I think in Tyrone in the past it's been very structured. Everything's very, very structured. You go here, you go there, Matty Donnelly, you know, he's been very structured in the way he plays. If if you empower your players, and um, which is what happened when 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 Kerry played against God, you empower the players to make their own decisions. And then on the back of that, you will get success. So I think they need to empower Conor McKenna and the likes of McShane when he's when he's there and playing well, and uh, the likes of Donnelly, you know. But I, I you know, was, I, I definitely wouldn't have any fear that Throne, uh, if I was a Throne fan, that, that they'll come good. You know, I think they'll be really strong contenders this year. And the first game on Sunday, um, Dublin defeating Roscommon one twenty-two uh, to sixteen points. I suppose the big talking point from this game is, was seeing the Sinbin in action, Paddy. What did you make, I suppose, of seeing it in action two or three times during this game? Look, I think, look, it's, it's look, uh, I think, look, I do, I think it's a good idea. I think it is, like, provided the, provided the right call is made, like, do you know, like, I, I look, I think in general, I think in regards referees, I think they've, look, uh, Coming back even to the black card and all this, I just think there's too many rules and too many. Dis- you're not gonna wear. like. I like the bottom line. I just think that if 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 the yellow card was imposed correctly early on in the game for cynical play, I think there was no need for sin binnings and no need for black cards and no need like you know. I just think that's I, and that sounds quite simple, but that's the way I totally see it. Like do you know, the referees, the game is getting so fast and there's so many decisions to be made. I just think like this, you know, it's just you know like it's it's. And sometimes the wrong decision can be made in it, like, and it's it's you know you're you're, you're losing a player or you're whatever or you're cursing off, and it's it's just yeah. So I just think that um, I just think I'm, I'm, you know I'm not a fan of it, you know. So yeah, so for me, if I my way, I'd I'd be just implementing the rules as they were a couple of years ago, and we'd that's be locked. All the boys down, party. That's the end. <laughs> oh, like yeah, but I suppose, but I think you know, no, but I suppose like if to me like right, yeah, it's it's, it's, it's a stream scenario, like, but I suppose it's. Like it's not just for the pull down, like do you know what I mean? There's other cynical play, and I just think that, um, yeah, look, that's my view on it. Like, you, like you have a fair point, but I just think that it's it's leading to more errors from referees rather than better refereeing performance. Better take it outside, take it out of the hands of the referees, maybe like drunk away. But I just think overall, I'm just not a fan of this extra rules as such. Same as it, look at look at the for I know we're not talking about hurling tonight, like, but that's another. <laughs> it's, it's the same mix. I suppose the first um, or the second symbol we've seen today was where a Dublin player got the ball on the inline and he was pulled down, but he wasn't going to get a goal. And I suppose that's what's going to frustrate people, Joe, because if it's anywhere inside the 21 and they're giving it, there's, there's just going to be too many symbols and it, it is going to destroy it again. Yeah, and, and Paulie's right. Like it's It's... Too many rule changes, and it was only listening today. Like, there's a it seems to be a new rule every year, and it's as if we need to keep changing the game, and you know, just for the sake of it. And like, yeah, fair enough. If a lad is coming through one on one with the keeper, or one on one with the defender, and he's going by him and he gets pulled down, yes, it should be. And it is to take away that actual, very obvious chance of a goal scoring opportunity. This crack, if there's two players inside you, and you know, it happened with the soccer rule, um, and it eventually sort of evolved into you know. It was worked out of it nearly that you know there was there was there wasn't as many um, red cards for it, but you know we, we've got we've got to be clever about this. We're going to ruin the game with stoppages and sin bins, and um, you know it, it's 
if the referees do the job right, um, and I know that might sound harsh, but at the end of the day, like it's the same with the, the likes of the mark and these things. The reason the mark were, was brought in because to protect players inside the board line and also at midfield. If a lad catches the ball at midfield and he's surrounded by three lads, what used to happen is the referee would give him for overcarry. He's after making a catch in the middle of the pitch, give him the opportunity. If he doesn't get away, three lads around him, it should be his free. You know, and that this is what creates these these changes in the rules and it's quite frustrating for players you know the players are putting all the hard work and next thing there's another rule change another rule change so you have to work on that and, and sort of get your head around this one and oh and there's too much of an interpretation that for referees to be able to bring in but there's actually no black and white and every referee but you ask them they'll referee the games differently and the referee the rule different differently you know so it's very hard when there's more rules coming into the ref and not it's, and it's not fair on the refs either you'll bring more rules in for them. The next thing is the, the, the need eyes at the back of the heads. And we're talking about two referees, refereeing games these days. And it's, um, it, it's, it's just very frustrating. And lads are going to get very annoyed playing with it. And um, I, I think there just has to be line drawn, you know, make what's best for the game rather than just for the sake of changing rules. And um, yeah, obviously if it allows me one-on-one with the keeper, it's a, it's a, it's a sin bin and, a, and, and penalty. There's no issue there, but, but this, it, it's always the extreme. That's the problem. You know, it's it's not a, a little tinkering of it. It's always full extreme, and, that, and that's why why players get annoyed. And Danny, that's a good point. Uh, Joe makes there about how there's too many rules, and we're always trying to change something. I suppose it was the mark last year, and now it's the same this year. Do you think there has been too many rules in the last few years? Changes. Joe, Joe, Joe was spot on when he said that they're destroying the game and whoever's coming up with these rules and the GA have to be come out, uh, uh, accountable to the members. We are all members of the GA through our clubs and through our counties and the GA are systematically going through it uh, and not unlike what they've done with VAR in, in, in soccer, um, they're destroying the game simply because you know they're looking for uh, black and white decision making in real time. And in sport, it never has been like that. There's elements of grey and there's elements of gamesmanship and everything and, and, and um, you know, and shading. There's always been shading in sport, but it's how obvious uh, it is. And uh, the GAR systematically trying to destroy our game to the constant tinkering of the rules. And, you know, practical things like putting in a second referee is a practical thing to trial and still they haven't done that. And it's to help out the guys that maybe one, referees maybe aren't good enough to referee at that level um, and they seem to get game on game. Uh, two, the referees aren't uh, disciplined for poor performances. They're not taken away and, and rested for a week like they do in other sports. It's just simply not good enough. You don't know what the referee is making that decision for as well. They're not mic'd up. And uh, we're being rewarded now for very, very basic things like catching a ball from from a twenty meter kick from outside the ball. Like, like Joe would would in your game, Joe, and the, the way you played, the style that you played, you know, if you had him sitting in at full forward and and somebody, I love it. Like, but it just doesn't make sense to the game. It's a, it's, it's, it's ridiculous. It's absolutely ridiculous. Like who who felt that that was a thing that was worth. That was worth taking away the skills of defending and blocking and all those. It's it's a disgrace. And how we've all put up with it, how there isn't a total outcry on the Sunday game and, and all those other things. Um, people talked about the, the Super League and soccer and the outcry there was over that from a media perspective. They're, they're destroying our game. And, and nobody's, you know, bar me, ranting on the ears, but... I don't know how you may get your viewership off, Paul, but I, I just think I just think the GPA nearly need to step in as well and they need to apply pressure. And I will be disappointed from that perspective as well that nobody wants to see those rule changes. The, the manager certainly don't want it. The players don't want it. And all we're asking is for good officials. That's all we're properly trained officials that know the game rather than the rule book, that understand the game rather than the rule book. And if that means a second referee goes to one half and, you know, there's a senior referee and then a, a secondary junior referee in another half of the field, I, I have no wish that. But changing the bloody rules every every year is farcical. And in my opinion, that's Larry McCarthy's starting point before 
the game is totally destroyed. I suppose uh, getting back to the game between Dublin and Roscommon, um, probably like again, new players for Dublin standing up, Tom Lehiff, um in midfield, Darren Mullen at wing forward. They just seem to be able, like usual, to always have these one or two and the one or two that came through today impressed again. Yes, but I suppose it's just, I think it's a reflection of, I suppose, the, the, the preparation that Dublin have. Like, And I suppose while I think newcomers do well based on having good experienced players around them, so that's not taking away from their performances today. Like, But it's, you know, like it's kind of like those lads were, you know, stepping up today because they had the likes of Caron Kennedy's, they had the likes of Brian Fenton's, you know, uh, Johnny Small around them. Like, so that kind of gives them kind of, you know, they've winners around them. Like that, you know, that gives them added belief straight away. Like, do you know, and you'll say, well, how can Dublin produce it? Like, but I just think it's, well, right, there's, there has been a change of management, say, from, say, last year or well, from the year before, obviously, with Jim Gavin. But still, I just think Dublin are always looking ahead too, as well as just, they're not just looking at the game next week. They're, all, they're always looking ahead of, you know, where might they need to find new players? And it's just, look, I just think it's, it's down to, look, when you're a successful team and you've had a success at Dublin, and you might say the population, there is an essence, there's always going to be the same numbers or players coming through. You know, not always necessarily the same quality of a Brian Fenton, but, but at the same time, I just think overall it's a reflection of the preparation um, that goes into that. Like, and, um, and I sometimes think from a Dublin performance, I guess, of course, I know we, we've all discussions about money and funding, etc. Like, but I think the lads would agree with me here, like this, you know, anytime you look at Dublin, and you'll just say, like, that's a well-coached team or that's a team that makes a lot of good decisions or they, they're very clear on what they're about, you know, and I think, you know what I mean? Right, so, like, I think you have to, yeah, so that's kind of, that's the angle I see regards that. And, and um, again, as I said, the young fellas coming in today, you know, very clear on what they're about. And that's, you know, overall, I just think that's a good reflection on how Dublin operate. And that's part of the reason why they've had so much success over the last number of years. As well, probably like for Ross Common, obviously, um, Jeremy Merta missing a great chance where Carl Craig hand passed the ball to, across to him and he pammed it, but it hit the post. I suppose it was just like any team when they played Dublin. Like Ross Common did have chances and they were competitive, but I was like when you play Dublin, if you don't take them chances, you're going to be severely punished on the scoreboard. I think so. Like, and I think that it's like I know we discussed Kerry earlier on, like, but like, eh, like. Yeah, you have to take a chances because no matter what, Dublin are going to get chances. And they've proven that since they've evolved, like say, back to when they played Tyrone in, in the All-Ireland semi-final. I think it was 2017 or 18 where they, they like at that stage, Tyrone had a very structured defence and um, Dublin dismantled it. Like, And I just think that, and then even back to Kerry, say, losing the All-Ireland semi-final or All-Ireland final replay two years ago. And like part of that reason, you said Kerry missed chances, but still, Dublin still were able to break carry down very easy like so I just think based on that it's grand to have it like when you play Dublin like if or, like today like if you get a sniff of a chance you've got to take it because Dublin have shown over the last number of years like that no matter how you would set up against them they have the quality and they have the we call it the what I call the tactics or the setup and so on that they are going to create chances like so yeah so that's um yeah like missed opportunities like but I still think you know you know, I still fancy Dublin to win the game beforehand, like, and no, no respect to, to Ross Common, like, but I just think today there was there was always going to be one winner. And as well, Joe, you mentioned how impressive Cormac Costello was today, and Dean Rock wasn't in the panel, and then like the two Baskells, we've seen what they've been doing for Bally Bowden, like all these forwards leaving the panel, and the people now are coming in getting their chances, they're not really weakening it at all. Just an extremely confident bunch of players. Um, it's very seamless from minor to twenties all the way through, and, and it comes to comes with the management that has followed through from obviously Jim and obviously De- Desi on board now. And it's um, you know, as Paulie was saying, the structure from he- from the top down, from the county board all the way down. So that that's why I was a wee bit surprised with you know the hoo ha and the Ferrar that around the training situation a couple of months ago. You know, that just wasn't like Dublin. It's not usually like them to get sort of caught up in anything like that. And it was a bit of a surprise to me. And it's, um, look, I'm not saying it, it's it's a weakness this year, but it just should, it wouldn't have happened in any other years. Um, but they're, they're just extremely, extremely well drilled. And, and 
whoever comes into a position, you know, two new lads coming in here again against Ross Common, like them two boys knew knew exactly what to do. They're so confident, you know. You know, if you look at some of the new lads onto another county team, maybe, you know, they might be a wee bit deterred from maybe showing and, and having the confidence to go up and kick a point. The two of them kick point a point each, I think. Um and other players probably wouldn't have the have the confidence because you know they'll be second guessing themselves maybe, but these boys are so confident in themselves, you know, mentally that they're, they're one of the you know, when when it comes to mental strength as a team and a squad, they're, they're just top, top notch. And you see that when the pressure comes on. You know, there was I think there were eight six up and, and then Dublin got the penalty. So that probably didn't help Ross Common as well. You know, if you're in the game next thing, the, I think it was 20, 18, 20 minutes into the game and Dublin get a penalty, they go five up, six up, you know, and then the game's gone. Whereas you're two points up, you, you might get a chance. If they get take that goal chance, they go point up next thing, you know, mentally that they're still in the game and it gives them confidence going into the second half, you know. So it's it's fine lines in in a game and especially against Dublin, like you look over the last couple of years and even all Ireland finals, you know, teams had a lot of chances to, 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 you know, take against them and to take them, you know, and if you do that against Dublin and no disrespect to Ross Common, they won't be at the level of Kerry and the likes of Mayo over the last couple of years. And, you know, so, so they have to be extremely efficient when they're taking their chances and opportunities. And look, it wasn't a bad start for Ross Common. You know, they'll, they'll be happy enough. We'd probably put up a bit of a score and, I look, Dublin missed two penalties. They hit the post, and the other one, I think, Oster just popped over the bar at the last kick of the ball. So it could have been a lot worse for Roscommon, but it's. I, I think I think they won't be overly disappointed with it, with how it went, but it's um, you know, it's Dublin, and they still weren't even expecting to win the game. So I was, for them, it's good to get going, and they'll have to look at other games and where they're going to get points off Kerry and Galway. But it's going to be a tough road for Roscommon for the rest of the league, I think. As well, um, the other game in Division One, um, Irma defeating Monaghan one sixteen to one twelve. Um, in the end, um, Danny, it was comfortable really for Irma. They led nearly from start to finish, and it it it's a huge win for them, obviously, to kickstart this Division One campaign and their first game without Jamie Clark as well. It it's showing that there is strength in that panel. Yeah, well, I, I, you know, Monaghan and Armagh were both major, major rivals here. There's not a lot of love there um, because of the proximity, obviously, and just there, there's there's a rivalry there that, you know, I suppose both the counties have got used to in, in recent times. But more, moreover, Armagh and Monaghan have been, you know, arguably more successful this last decade than Armagh have. Um, so... I expected, to be honest with you, I expected Armagh to win this game because Monaghan, yes, they, they had a change in backroom teams and stuff, but they are a team that's aging. They have an aging squad there. You know, they've, Conor McManus is in his 30s there and, you know, what a wonderful player he is, uh, continues to be and, and is. But, you know, obviously as time goes on, they're over-reliance on Conor McManus and McManus's powers of performance will wane. Just with the age, just natural progression, I suppose, like it, like it happened to everybody. But Connor, um, you know, Monaghan's reliance on him make make the latter end of any championship going to be very, very difficult for Monaghan. So uh, Armagh are different, where they have completely cleaned out their their backroom team. They've introduced Kieran Donaghy, and funny, I was uh, with a friend of mine um, two weeks ago, and I was talking to Kieran at Lance, and listen, he's a guy that will. That will definitely re-energize uh, the setup there. You know, people. K- Kieran's been there a very long time, and Kieran McGinney's an exceptional manager, exceptional, exceptional man manager as well. But it would be brilliant for for him to even have Kieran in there. And Kieran's such a wonderful character uh, that the boys will, I think, they'll really respond to it. So I'm not surprised Darman won that match. Jamie Clark, for me, Jamie Clark has been, you know a player that had the potential to be a Clifford, but, you know, he had all our lifestyle choices and uh, certainly had had it in his uh, armory to go and be that type of player in Ulster, um, but never fulfilled, un- unfulfilled potential, I would say, about Jamie. And, uh, you know, whether he's there or not, I think Arma have always moved on from Jamie. And when he was available and he was committed, 
he's been a bonus. When he hasn't been available, um, Armagh have just moved on. So I think, you know, Jamie, uh, his first preference is in football and uh, Armagh, I think, have, have moved on from that. Um, um, so, you know, it's a fantastic start for Armagh. I know they would have been disappointed that they weren't getting to play more teams down south, the carries of this world, etc. Um, that it is very much an, an Ulster thing there. So, uh, but it's a great start for them, and it's a game that they needed to be winning to make sure that they consolidated themselves in that division. You know, and as well, Monaghan tried to do something different today. Um, probably of leaving Conor McManus on the bench and see how they cope with him, but he was on the pitch by half time, and <laughs> was if it, if it shows anything, it's just showing body that. Monaghan will struggle without Conor McManus. Oh, certainly. And like they've other players like Darren Hughes and so on, or you know, like this. Yeah, but I suppose look, there could have been different reasons for why he didn't start today because of the fact that there's you know it's been a different type of preparation. And like as Danny touched on his bit older, they might just say, look, it suited him just to play half a game, or maybe they had plans only to play maybe 15, 20 minutes, but because of the way things were going, maybe they felt they needed to bring it, bring him in earlier. Like, but yeah, look, look, like Monaghan had some young players introduced today, like but look, based off the last number of years, we know they're heavy reliant on, on Conor McManus. No matter how well they were playing, they were always reliant on Conor McManus. Like so, yeah. Look, isn't that that is the big question mark? Like it's either going to be for this year for Monaghan, like to to progress, like or say to win an Ulster Championship. It's either going to be Conor McManus is going to do what Conor McManus, McManus has done on the big day, you know, numerous and he has to repeat that numerous times. Or the story they are going to unearth one or two young players are going to support that or they're going to sit up slightly differently. But look, at the moment, I'd be agreeing more like what Danny's touching there, like that, you know, I just feel they're not quite at, you know, they won't quite be at the the level that's needed to um to, to win an Ulster Championship. But look, who knows, maybe I'll be proved wrong. And Joe, as well, the Irma inside full forward line today of uh, Rory Grugan, Stephen Campbell and Reed O'Neill contributing 110 out of the 116. But, I suppose a big thing with our mad that has kind of went on the low is Ross McQuillan as well is back from the AFL for our mad this year, so he's definitely going to boost this our mad team as well. Yeah, definitely. Like, um, yeah, any lads come back from Australia from I'm not too sure like how long he was over there. It was a year or two, so you know, a year or two over with an AFL team, you know, the condition, the training, you know, the mentality that they get from a professional sport will only you know, help and, and bring that back in, into any, any squad. You'll see that from most of the lads who've come back from the AFL over the last couple of years. Um, Armar looked very strong, very fit, extremely fit and fast. Um, whereas Monon looked a wee bit laboured. You know, they looked a wee bit out, out of options. Um, they kicked, I think, 12 wides in the game and they were taking shots from all angles. Um, Armar looked to be very sort of structured, the 40, the, the, the line set up across the 45 for the defensively found Monon found that very hard to try and break down but in the, where Amara probably have improved again from last year you know we were saying that they're just lacking something their transition was very direct you know it wasn't last year they were sort of going over and back you know maybe lads weren't were afraid to take that killer pass or you know go for the juggler but it seemed you know, they, they had a lot of confidence to go at the Monaghan defence and the sort of the, the angles that were, they were playing with was, was you know, it, it, it is something different from last year. And, you know, Rory Groom kicked six points and I think Stefan Campbell kicked 1-1 one, one and Marino on the end. Like, they, these boys are very, very good footballers if they can get, get opportunities and the ball just gets into them. And that was probably where I'm at last year. They were very slow in the build-up. So as a full forward line, you know, you're struggling to get ball. Next thing, you've got three or four lads surrounding you. So you're, you're finding it hard to get your shots off. And it did look very evident that they've tried to change that to, to start attacking with pace, great opportunities for the inside forward line. And one thing I did notice today was the two keepers. I, I don't know if these keepers are starting to get a wee bit excited. The two of them were out around the half forward line. I know Began is great on the ball. He comes out, creates that extra man. He was up at the um, 45 at one stage and, and the RMR keeper was out trying to solve it through the middle of the pitch and got gets overturned. And you know, it's I don't know if they're getting a wee bit excited with themselves, but I hope we don't start seeing after all the keepers kicking freeze that all the keepers are going to start coming up thinking they're going to start kicking one three or one four in the middle of a game, you know, because it's it's just a bit crazy. Um, 
it's a trend, Joe, that seems to be even in the, in the soccer where they're starting to play out from the back. Even the fact of teams that just lump it forward and they're just getting caught. And you, you sort of question after the fifth time of getting dispossessed or the third goal being buried, when are they going to learn not to play it out from the back, you know? I know. It's a, it's a bit of a trend, I think, that's going on here with keepers, you know? But it's oh, definitely. Not- and I, I don't know what, what's going to happen, but sorry, Paddy. No, I was just saying there, but it's actually something that's actually, um, I know I'm onto hurling now again, like, but if you, I've just seen snippets of some of the National League games this year, and you watch it, like, um, where the goal is actually advancing there too, like, and it, it's like the hurling are co- copying the football, like, that, like, we, you know, if the option is not going forward in our own half, we'll turn back and we'll pop it back to the goalie and take it out to the other side. But, you know, and the goalie's coming out more, which is, you know, so like, and you say you get punished a lot quicker in hurling, but look, who knows? It's, it's a trend anyway. So, uh, yeah, we'll see what happens. And there's nothing like the GA to jump on a trend and go with it. Like, oh, yeah. I'll tell you, yeah. <laughs> yeah. We'll see. We'll see what happens. But yeah, that was just one thing that I did notice from the days, today's game. Um, moving on to Division 2 to have a quick look at it. Um, Mayo comfortably defeating down 221 um, to 111. Um, I suppose when we were looking at this game, Danny, we thought down would have a chance here because usually Mayo are slow to start, but the youngsters that came in from Mayo really hit the ground running, even the youngsters who were there last year built on their form and Mayo showed no mercy at all. No, no, on the ruthless. Um, really could have won by more uh, when you when you break down the game and uh, I suppose Down got a goal. Uh, Stephen Conway got a very good goal actually and uh, I suppose that put a, a better look on it from our perspective. I suppose we 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 got to be realistic about what where we are um, as a county, and you know I, I talked to one very very disappointed uh, player last night, and uh, you know when when you look at it, it we've <laughs> as I, I I just said to him, listen, in a hundred and thirty years of GA football, we've been in six All Ireland finals and we won five of them, so we have to put all this in perspective. We won't haven't won an Ulster title since nineteen ninety four. Um, and sometimes you get a crop of players that come through and um, you can you can do something, you can win something. But, um, you know, we, we just don't have that at the minute. Um, you know, again, I suppose yesterday um, with Keely Mooney um, and Ke- Keenan spent some time at the AFL and stuff. And no matter how good you are, you need a, you need a midfield as a platform. And, and we have really struggled around the middle. Like Keelan would probably be a wing back or half forward in any other team. But because of our lack of options really around the middle, he's, he's had to go to the middle of the field at times. And, uh, you know, when you're not winning the ball around the middle, the kickouts are dictated by it. Um, breaking balls dictated by it. The ability to go forward and get scores is dictated by it. So um, it's a problem that, you know, we're finding very, very hard to solve year in, year out. And, you know, Paddy Talley uh, is doing his best there to try and max the squad. We've lost a couple of players from the team um, through injury and through just players players leaving and up and out for, for the time being. So we were, we were up against it. And you have to say that this is a down team that's very inexperienced, have a bit of pace, but very inexperienced. And you have a Mayo team that five months ago were in an all Iron final. And, and rightly so, and, and their class and the experience that some of the young guy, guys have. And even with the guys that have retired in the winter time, some of them had dropped into the panel being being used as subs. So the guys that ha- had been introduced in the championship last year and maybe have been there two or three years, like Conroy yesterday, I think, got, got one three, I think. Um, but again, he, he's, been, he's been there for a couple of years now, very, very strong player, and we've seen him do wonderful things in the past, but has been inconsistent. So it just takes a couple of years. Every The guys will tell you is that it does take a couple of years to get consistent at the county level. And, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's going to be a steep learning curve for down. Um, I think all the games are away. So it's just going to be really, really tough. And uh, we just have to accept where we are at the moment. Um, and, and Mayo certainly haven't gone away. Going to be, I, I, I would back them to, to win Connacht. Um, and you could see them definitely semi-final final again this year. Um, but listen, it's early days. We, we don't know. Um, but surely with, with the way Galway are, you, you would have to say that uh, 
it's probably Roscom or it's probably Mayo Roscommon at this stage and uh, and Galway. And as well, um, Cork uh, Puddy. It was a game. I suppose a lot of people were expecting them to win, but we talked about Kildare having potential and that they needed to put a performance in. And it looked going on yesterday. Um, four point winners over um, Cork, and they did look comfortable at stages during that game. That it was an impressive Kildare performance. It was, but again, but I think it's. It, it, I suppose already it wasn't the exact same as the Kerry Galway like, but still it was kind of like Cork started the game very well, you know, the, you know, first quarter, you know, you'd say yeah, this is exactly where we want to be first game in a long time, but then like you'd say you'd look at the the performance for the last three quarters and you said it was very poor, Do you know, like so I think look credit Kildare look I think Jack Connor look he, obviously he'd be very, you know, set up teams against Cork for many times being involved with Kerry or whatever, but like, um. But I just think that overall it was a combination. I think Kildare would be delighted. I think it was a very important game, you know, and um, obviously Kildare could kick on and look, there's no reason why Cork can't sort things out over the next two games, you know, like, but I think it was, look, it was a combination. Look, I think Cork's, this, like, as I said, based on this, the start they had, like, I just think they'd have to be very disappointed with the performance. There was just, you know, there was just, you know, poor decisions. There's times when through the game couldn't win possession. When they had possession, they just, they seem to run out of ideas at times to a degree like you know just, just it was just kind of a an up and down like and whether that's down to confidence whether you know fellas were indecisive or getting turned over and you know who knows like but it's just um yeah so I just think I I give Claire credit for the fact that in the bottom line is for both teams yes they they wanted to win you know obviously every team wants to win but I think it was important for them was just for getting to win getting the two points you could you know and um, they'd have been the two teams perceived to be the favourites to, to come out of the group at the start, like in performances can follow, like, and I suppose based off it, Kildare got a decent performance, got two points, but that was helped by a poor performance overall by Cork, which helped Kildare. Like. And Paddy, like, just looking at that Cork forward line uh, on Saturday, Brian Hurley obviously had an influence in the game, but then had to go off injured. Um, Luke Connolly and Mark Collins. Uh, out to injury, I think, as well. The one thing when you did look at that court forward line was that there wasn't a lot of scoring power in the forward line. Do you think that was an issue yesterday for the forwards? Yeah, well, yes, I suppose it was to a degree, like, but then it's it's down to right, your scoring power, but then you can have all the scoring forwards inside. But if you know, if you're not maybe creating space, you're not moving the ball as quickly, or if you're just you know, if you don't have enough possession, at times Cork came under pressure on their own kick out. You know, from general, like, like if you have a good kick out, long kick out, we've seen in games, but then you're attacking into space. Like, so, look, I, th- I think, look, it was a factor, but it wasn't, look, it was, we're not looking at a situation here where Cork played really well in certain parts of the game and then they were just missing, just reliant on maybe a few extra finishers. I think there was, you know, there were different parts of a Cork game was under pressure yesterday. Look, and reflection are we looking in? Yes, obviously Luke Connolly, Mark Collins, etc. injured, you know. Like, but look, I think heading into the game, and Killian Hanlon, who lined out 11, like normally midfielder, he's out of crucial as well, like for the year. Like, but I think that like they were lost, but I think Ron McCarthy would have looked at the at the, the, the team he had yesterday and would feel like that you know that he had more depth, you know, like in a way, like and but like I suppose on the way home from um, Turles yesterday, like I think that you know he'll be. You know, he'd be questioning a few things. But look, I suppose the bottom line is there's a quick turnaround and I'm right in thinking they've cleared away, I think, next weekend. You know, like, and that's, uh, yeah, clear. I've had Cork's number in, in, in a few games over the last number of years, like, so it is, it's not going to get any easier. And a huge result as well, Paddy, for Clare today, defeating Leash by seven points. There was obviously a lot of questions of how they would cope without Gary Brennan going into this game. Yes, and even I acknowledged that a few weeks ago about like and also Gordon Kelly was a very experienced defender. But then, and and thinking about it, like this is like we've mentioned different teams here already tonight, and you look at Clare, like they're irrespective of what players they have, and they're well established in Division Two, you know, and that's not a team like just hanging on every year in Division Two, like they've they've beaten some very strong teams, or you know, or they've ran a lot of good teams close, all right? They were lucky not to qualify for Super Eights a couple of years ago. You know, right, they've been lucky maybe they've always promoted, I think all the years per last year, they've been on Kerry's side of the draw in the Munster Championship, like, but this is a team that has that has performed, like, consistently, like, so, right, 
like naturally enough, yes, they were down, they've lost Gary Brennan and, and um, uh, Gordon Kelly, but they've a spine of, of good players still there, like to Kevin Hart and Owen Cleary, you know, um, Jamie Malone, you know, etc. Like, you know, so like team, players that have been through all that, like, so I think like that. I, was, I wasn't expecting him to, to win as comfortable today, but I think they got, if I'm right, I think they got, um, they kind of pushed ahead in the second quarter, got a goal and a couple of points just to create that lead, you know, and obviously then from there, then they were able to, to build on that, like, so, but like, yeah, look, I, I, I think I said a few weeks ago, like, you know, this, you know, while they've lost those two players, they're still going to be a mighty hard team to beat um, this year in Division 2, like, and I think any team that's like, if you, if you, it's going to, if you beat Clare, you're going to have to play well. Like, and I think they're, I suppose maybe it's the last thing that they would have come away from the Munster Championship last year, bitterly disappointed um, with their loss to Tipperary. Like, as I said, it was the first year they were on the, the opposite side to Kerry. Like, so I think it, it isn't a human nature. We touched on Kerry. Like, this, you know, you've had a disappointing season. You know, um, you've had no, you've been, you know, there's been, you've been locked up. You've had no football for months. Like, you're, you know, there's a bit of hurt there. Like, you have a cause, you could say, like, and, yeah, and I think that's what they had. To, that's probably that's what it was feeling as well today. Like you know, and um, yeah, that's why I suppose it's just setting up. Um, uh, that's what's going to make it really challenging for um, I suppose from a car perspective, where you look at it like for the next game, you know. And as well, uh, Joe uh, Mead uh, came up against West Mead on Sunday, and it was a game. I suppose we were expecting Mead to win more comfortably and just scraped over the line in the end. Yeah, it was a uh, it was a bit close now to be honest than what we would have liked. We were actually a couple of points behind. We were three points down or four points down at with about ten minutes to go, and we um, made a couple of substitutions and had a big big in, impact in the, in the, the last ten or fifteen minutes. I think we got five points off the bench, and to be honest, they're probably players that probably should be starting. Um, I'm just hoping Andy isn't getting into this mindset that we're trying to start our best finish with our best team on 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 the pitch and. Look at the minute we just don't have that luxury of that amount of players we had to do that and you know it just showed today like West Me, the team that we we're expecting to beat, you know, had us to the pin of our collars and we there, there was a big big loss obviously we've lost we've lost Ronan Jones for the year. I think he's broken his arm, which is a massive loss for us. He's a he's a player that was you know, he's only twenty one or twenty two and he played very well last year and he, I think he was only gonna start coming into his own at midfield and it's it's a it's a big a big setback for for the squad and um, there's not many players that we have there to replace him and uh, Shane Walsh was out as well and I know Andy commented after the game that we have players to come back in and look we'll, we'll hopefully get them back for next week and um, be able to set up better than what, what we probably did today like we we were under pressure to win the game uh, and that's that's not what we needed we were at home and it was um, it was a game for us and look it's the first game we've come we had a couple of new lads in on the, in on the team and um, starting off as well and hope I'm hoping that is the case but it, it just it doesn't look too good from from a Meads perspective that we just up, scraped over the line at home against West Mead and it's uh, it's something that Andy's going to have to probably look at uh, over this week if look there's not a quick turnaround there's a quick turnaround so we don't have much time to be reviewing games and and, and he, he'll probably have a quick look but. I still don't think we know our best team, and that's the problem. Um, especially in the short, sharp way that games are coming thick and fast. You need the consistency. You need you can't be chopping and changing and looking trying to find players here, there, and everywhere. We need to have a set team going forward. And you know, I think some of the players that come on today, like to Brian Mahan, Eamon Wallace, um, um Scully come on, Jason Scully come on with new actually the John Wright is his first game for me. It's great to see him, he's from Kells and He's been there or thereabouts over the last couple of years and he, he got a point and was very influential in the last 10 minutes. So it, it's it's good to see that. But I think we've probably got to get sort of our experienced players on and probably our better players on to start the game and get us at a good foot to go forward over the next couple of weeks because we're going to need them. And two standout results just then in Division 3. Um, Danny, we were talking about how important it would be for Cavan to back this up um, and they came up short against Fermanagh and with Derry still to play it's no guarantee that they will beat Derry it's a major setback for Mickey Graham's side losing to Fermanagh at the weekend It is and uh, it was um, it was something that I was pro- probably uh, talking about during the week um, about whether Ka- Calvin can 
can carry this favourite tags in the games. Uh, there was no doubt that in most of the games last year, you know, the down game, invariably two very, very even teams that could have went either way. But at half time, it looked like down would run away with that game. And, and Calvin really had nothing to lose on the, the, the two of the kits and sink it down and ended up worthy winners. But that was a half of football. And they were uh, in the Ulster final, they were very impressive. Um, the semi final was a wake up call um, to them. And yes, the, you know, sport has a, there's a great storyline behind. Um, stories like Calvin to come out of nowhere, um, and especially on the, the the anniversary of Bloody Sunday, it was a, it was it was nearly like uh, it, was, it was written written by the gods. But from from Calvin's perspective, because of the short lead in time to now to the championship, you know, as Joe said rightly, you need to be getting your best team onto the field, um, and when. Uh, you know, I'm not sure, I suppose, on injuries and different things that uh, Calvin had, but they looked to be very, very strong. They'd be very, very disappointed to come away and not win that game, especially against Fermanagh, who, let's be honest, had one game last year in the championship, couldn't, couldn't have had couldn't have had a huge amount of time uh, like everybody else from preparing for this year's this year's league. So that's a blow to them. And then Derry had a great win. They had a really, you know, double-digit um uh, uh, when so you would have to say that Calvin, uh, whether they're not taking the league serious, um, whether they're just more or less going through the motions, but you would think that if they want to progress, if they want to get better with that uh, Ulster Championship win behind them, you would need to think that they would want to move up the d- divisions, you know, um, and test the medal to try and get better as a panel, as a group. So, uh, yeah, I'm not sure how. How well Calvin will were the favourite tags, um, and now you've seen it this weekend in the results. So um, it'll be interesting now to see how they back it up against Derry. You know, then just the results in a uh, Division Three uh, South. Um, Offaly defeated Wicklow one fourteen to one ten. Um, then Limerick bet tip one thirteen to fourteen points. And Polly, like we were talking about this game, how. Limerick could be looking for revenge and once they brought on Ian Corbett and Brian Donovan in the second half they changed the game and I think hit 1-2-1-3 one, one, on the trots straight after half time and it was just a difference in this game Yes, like, and I think like, look, I guess with the fact obviously, you know, Tipperary Munster champions and that got a lot of recognition last year because in the day, you know provincial title is, is a provincial title like, you know, but I think Getting away from that and looking at recent performances between both those sides, like like I like, you know both those counties really well, being have been involved with both of them, like this, like Limerick defeated Tipperary in the championship in two thousand and nineteen, and then last year, we all remember Connor Sweeney's score from the sideline. I think if I'm right, which took the game to extra time. Am I right? You know, like so, you know, like so. At the end of the day, and right, and also with that, you have a Limerick team. Like it's it's a it's a battle to get out of Division Four. And you look at the last number of years, like two teams, other teams that spring to mind. I think, remember, in Carlow and Turlock O'Brien, they got out of Division 4 and they bounced up. If I'm right, did they get up to Division 2 for, you know, and then you'd like sort of, um, remember Leash, like, you know, they're, they're up in Division 2 and they were initially a couple of years ago, they were back down. But, you know, like, so it's kind of the team that gets out of Division 4, like, or went, they're in an upward curve, like, so based on where the momentum or the belief that Limerick will get from get, finally getting out of Division 4 for the first time in a number of years, then knowing in their recent history playing Tipperary, irrespective of Tipperary being monster champions, they'd feel like that they could, um, you know, that they were they certainly given the game and they were, well, like, they felt they believed they could beat them, you know, and I think maybe that was the case today, like, you know, and um, that once they got that, you know, that, that, that bit of um, peer dominance, like, they kicked on, like, and look, even me, like I suppose I, would, I was expecting a very close game, of course, maybe yes, because you, you give the side edge to Tipperary, but, uh, but I'm sitting here, am I surprised? I have one bit, like, you know, and I look at the panel, you know, that, that Limerick panel is getting stronger and, um, and even getting more experience. Like, so yeah, it's, it's, it's a surprise for in the general scheme of things, but, you know, I think, look, it, that, that, that division is all to play for now, you know, and it'll be interesting how it goes in the next few weeks. Yeah, then there's the results in Division 4 North. Uh, Sligo 219, Leitrim 18 points, Loud 38, Antrim 115. And then in Division 4 South, uh, Cairo 316, Waterford 10 points. But um, that's all on today's show. Um, we'll be back uh, later in the week with a preview show. But thanks.